I was in high school, my grade 12 class took a four-day trip into the interior of Algonquin. It was a canoe trip that none of us were prepared for. It was just me, 30 other unprepared teens, and three teachers whose job it was to keep us all alive. On this trip, we had to pack in absolutely everything that we would need for these four days. That meant food, toiletries, clothing, a bedroll, all stuffed into our oversized packs. And so we buddied up, two to a canoe, and we set off deep into the wilderness of Algonquin with no means of communication. This was before, in the days before, a student and certainly a teacher could afford a cell phone that would work out in the woods. Now, we each had our own unique way of packing. The girls focused mostly on nutrition and personal hygiene. The boys packed mostly cured meats and fireworks. In the tent next to us, Clint and Chad produced a huge Ziploc bag filled with chili as their meal. They hoped to portion this chili out bit by bit, day after day, and heat it over a road flare. This was a mistake for three reasons. Number one, chili is very heavy to carry on long portages and the bags are volatile and prone to breaking. Number two, Clint and Chad discovered pretty quickly that a road flare will in fact cut through the bottom of a pot through its heat. And number three, and most importantly, a diet consisting mostly of beans is problematic when you do not have access to a flush toilet. Clint and Chad dug more holes that week than the skunk in my front yard. That wasn't the only plan that went awry. All of us had pretty much counted on bathing in the lake. Unfortunately, during this trip, it grew unbelievably cold and few of us were brave enough to go into the water. One can only imagine the smell on the bus on the way home especially near Chad and Clint. (laughs) When I got home four days later, as you might imagine, I took the longest shower of my life. I drained the tank, I used up all of the Irish Spring, and when I emerged from the shower, having not bathed for almost five days, I emerged and declared to my family that I now felt like a brand new man. I felt like myself again. Have you ever found that sometimes you just don't quite feel like yourself? Like, like maybe you've just gotten out of touch with the person that you are, are or the person that you know you should be. And you sometimes wonder how you can get back once again. Or maybe you're someone who's doing okay at life. Things are going along fine, but you've always sort of had this gut feeling that there's more to this life, and you're not sure that you've discovered who you were truly meant to be. If so, this series, dear friends, is for you. Over the next four weeks, I'd like to explore the topic of personal identity by suggesting that you were made to believe in him, that is God, belong to him, become like him, and befriend like him. And I call this series, Myself Again, Rediscovering You. I want to start today with the topic of belief. You were made to believe. Now, I can see some of you are raising your eyebrows. What does belief have to do with rediscovering who I am as a person? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I'd like to share that with you. 
You see, our understanding of who our creator is plays a huge role in how we see ourselves. Our understanding of who the creator is plays a huge role in how we see ourselves. Just think about it. Is there anyone in this world who has shaped more how you feel about yourself than your parents? Is there anyone who's had a bigger impact on how you feel about yourself than your parents? Even if you are 90 years old, the person you are today is shaped in many ways by the person or the people who raised you for the first 18 years of your life. If they affirmed you and loved you and hugged you, if you felt safe in their presence, This made a big impact. If they criticized you, pushed you away, used you, well, that leaves a mark as well. It's just too bad that we can't forward our therapy bills to our parents. A few years ago, my parents came to visit me from New Brunswick, and my dad and I were sitting alone on the front porch of our home, And we were chatting about old times, my childhood home, pets that we had had, trips we'd taken, when he said, you know, your mother really had a big hand to play in who you are as a person. I didn't really factor into who you are much at all. And that statement really caught me off guard. Well, I guess because he left before the sun came up and he got home around 5.30 every night, He felt like my mom just had a bigger role in in raising us boys. And I said, well, Dad, that's not true. I said, do you remember that summer when I was 17 and I'd never really worked a day in my life and I was so lazy? And on the first day of summer, you burst into my room and you said, on Monday morning, you're going to work at Croupy Paving. And you threw some boots at me and a hard hat and left. I said, Dad, that, that day changed my life because I went to work that following Monday and I found that I really liked being productive. I liked being good at things and I liked getting out of the house and, and seeing people. The work, of course, wasn't easy, but it was fulfilling. I said, I wouldn't be here today if you hadn't made that decision to care about me in that moment. I wouldn't have gone to Bible college. I probably wouldn't have gone to seminary, that's for sure. And I wouldn't be a pastor today. I'd be slouching my way through life. And it is true that my mom is the nurturing one and still is, but my father had a huge impact on me and my brother time and time again by the choices that he made for us when we were kids, but more than that, by the example that he set, he taught us how to be men. He taught us how to be men. And I told him so. Now my dad, as typical, tried to reflect the positive attention away from himself, and he said this. He said, we're just happy that you both grew up to be good people. When our kids are little, we set goals for our children and we make decisions for them. My wife and I spend hours every week discussing parenting strategies. Why? Because we have nothing better to do? Maybe some days. But mostly because We love them and we want them to be happy, healthy, and fulfilled adults when our time with them is done. Now let me ask you, do you ever think about your heavenly father in similar terms? That he has a plan for you, that he guides your life. That he spends a considerable amount of time trying to help you be the kind of person that he knows, that he knows that you can be. 
Now, I know that some people have a dominant image of God as a sort of cosmic cop who, whose job it is to hand out tickets for every moral infraction that we participate in, every foul word, every third glass of wine, every trip to Casino Rama. Yeah, I'm looking at some of you out here. I'm just kidding. Some of us have had a bad experience with religion over the years. I once had a masseuse who was chatty. You know what I mean? Chatty masseuse. You've had one before, or chatty barber, chatty hairdresser. I'm, I'm just looking to have the mas- my knots massaged out. She's here to tell me her whole life. I remember this particular uh, chatty person uh, gave you both M- good massage and her life story. One session, she told me all about in intimate detail about how when she was a teenager and she was enrolled in an all-Catholic girls' school and she would talk about how the nuns and the priests would, would hit her and hit the kids and they would, would throw things at them. And you know, that left a mark. Physically, but, but also emotionally. See, the truth is that most people out there don't really often have a very positive image of God. Either because of something they've been taught or heard or something that they have experienced. But what if, what if our dominant image of God was one of a loving parent? How would that change things? For us, Jesus said, Which one of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, that's in comparison to the perfect holiness of God, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And that's a really good question. What if our dominant image was that of a loving parent? How would that change things? You see, all of a sudden now, God is not a cosmic cop or judge, jury, and executioner, but a parent who simply wants his kids to be happy, healthy, and fulfilled adults. How would that shift your thinking not only about God, but also about you. Because if the God of the universe (laughs) loves me, then why shouldn't I love me? Does that make sense? It does to me. This is why when it comes to rediscovering who you are, belief is the starting point. Because to understand who you were to be begins with trusting not only what God says about himself, but also what he says about you. And I want to share with you a few things that he has said about you. He said, I created you in my own image. I knit you together in your mother's womb. I know the number of hairs on your head. For some of us less, for some of us more. Before a word is on your tongue, I know it. He said, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that while you were still hostile towards me, God says, you were reconciled to me by the death of my son. I didn't wait for you to ask for it. I just swooped in to save the day. Sin doesn't have the last word in your life. Grace gets the last word. That you who have believed are born again. That you have been adopted into God's family. You are children of God. You are, you are heirs. There is an inheritance coming for those who have been adopted as children of God. You are no longer orphans. You belong to me, and I love you as a perfect father. This is just scratching the surface of what God has to say about who you are. 
The question is, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Really and truly, deep down in your heart, do you believe this? Because it matters. And it matters because what God says about you is the starting point for discovering your true identity. As I said with the kids earlier, if you want to know what something was designed to be, you ask the Creator. I know that most of us here today would say that we believe in God. A few of you may not. You may have been dragged out by a relative or friend. Who knows? But the majority of us here would say, yeah, we believe in God. But what I'm talking about, dear church, is something that goes far, far deeper than mere intellectual assent that there is somewhere out there a higher power. I'm talking about believing to your core that what God says about himself is true. And believing to your core that what God says about you and about me is also true. Like your life depends upon it. Now in his book, How to Speak to Youth, Ken Davis tells the following story I'd like to share with you. He said, in college, I was asked to prepare a lesson to teach my speech class. We were to be graded upon our creativity and our ability to drive home a point in a memorable way. The title of my talk was The Law of the Pendulum. And he said, I spent 20 minutes carefully teaching the physical principle that governs a swinging pendulum. If you don't know what those principles are, the law of the pendulum is simply this, that a pendulum can never return to a point that is higher than the point from which it was released. Because of friction, because of gravity, when a pendulum returns, it will fall short of its original release point. And each time it swings, it makes less and less of an arc until finally the pendulum, and that which is at the bottom of it, finds a place of equilibrium. The state of rest where all the forces are acting on it equally is the state of equilibrium. And so Ken, wanting to drive home the point, got a whiteboard and he he got a three-foot string and a child's top and he secured it to the top of the blackboard with some tape or a thumbtack. He, He pulled the top to one side and he made a mark where it was to start and then he let it go. And every time it returned, he made another mark and another mark until it finally was at the bottom. When he was done proving his thesis, he asked how many people in the room believe that the law of the pendulum is true. And this is what he writes. All of my classmates raised their hands, and so did the teacher. He started to walk to the front of the room thinking the class was over. In reality, it had just begun. You see, hanging from the steel ceiling beams in the middle of the room was a large, crude, but functional pendulum. He had taken 250 pounds of metal weights tied it to four strands of 500-pound test parachute cord, and then he invited the instructor to climb up on a table with his back against a cement wall. And here's where things got a little dicey. He then brought the 250 pounds of weights right up to his teacher's nose, and then holding the huge pendulum just a fraction of an inch from his face, I once again explained the law of the pendulum he had applauded only moments before. If the law of the pendulum is true, then when I release this massive metal, it will swing across the room and return just short of the release point. Your nose will be in no danger. And after the final restatement of this law, I looked him in the eye and I asked, Sir, do you believe that this law is true. There was a huge, long pause. Beads of sweat formed on his upper lip, and then weakly he nodded, yes. Well, he says, I released the pendulum. 
It made a swishing sound as it arced across the room. At the far end of the swing, it paused momentarily and then started back. I never saw a man move so fast in my entire life. (laughs) He literally dived from the table, deftly stepping around the still-swinging pendulum. I asked the class, does he truly believe in the law of the pendulum? And the students unanimously answered, no. No. Dear church, most of us say that we believe. And we think that we believe. But when it comes right down to it, our faith hasn't moved from here to here. And that means when it comes time to trust in the promises of God, we cannot hold steady. You understand? This is important. I'm talking about believing to your core that what God says about himself is true and believing in your core what God says about you to also be true. Like your life depends on it. C.S. Lewis once wrote in A Grief Observed, You never know how much you really believe anything until its truth or its falsehood becomes a matter of life and death. It's easy to say you believe a rope to be strong as long as you are merely using it to cord up a box, but suppose you had to hang by that rope over a precipice, wouldn't you then first discover how much you truly, truly trusted it? So I want to issue us all a challenge this week. And it's a really simple challenge. It's a simple prayer. I'd like to challenge us all to ask this question of God, or this make this prayer to God. God, may you show yourself to me this week. May you let me know that you really are who you say you are, and that I really am who you say I am. Now this prayer seems pretty simple, But for some of us, it will take a lot of courage to pray this prayer every morning. And I'm telling you, your Father in heaven loves you more than you could possibly know. And when you invite him into your life, he will show up in unexpected ways. And you might even begin to feel a little bit more like yourself again. Now, next week, I want to talk about how we find our identity in belonging to him. But for now, let us pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning. We're at, we're at all different kinds of places on this journey with you. Some of us are just kind of God-curious want to know a little bit more about you and if you're something that we'd like in our lives. Some of us have been following you for 90 years, faithfully and joyfully. You are the best part of our lives and our strength, the times that we need you most. And a lot of us are somewhere in the middle on that journey. I pray for those who need you in a special way this morning whether they need to move that intellectual faith down into the heart of trust, or whether they just need to know that you are genuinely real in their lives. May you show up in an unexpected way for each person here this week, I pray. May you bless each one. May you draw close to each one. And Lord, we do pray for the many needs in this congregation, in this community, and beyond. You know the names of the people on our heart that we pray for day in and day out. You know those who are in hospital right now and those who are waiting for treatments and those who are waiting on test results and those who are struggling in other ways. We pray for our students that you would be with them when they are away at college and university. We pray for our our aging parents, that you would watch over them 
wherever they may be and keep them safe. We pray for our little children that you would watch over them and bless them as they study and learn about you even now in Sunday school. Lord, we pray for ourselves that you would strengthen us in the core of our inner being, that we would truly know who we were made to be, who we are, and that we would find that answer in you. So Lord, I thank you for each one here today. May you bless them. May you watch over them. And may you care for them as we pray together as the Lord Jesus Christ taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.